just to reiterate a little bit of uh, what uh, Wayne and Martin were saying. So, Operation Yellowhammer. I'm a Chief Emergency Planning Officer, so I always have to think worst case scenario. So that's what we plan for, but we hope it doesn't happen. We've had, uh, in, to help with the Brexit planning, £20 million allocated to local authorities across England. Uh, our share in Wigan is 210k. And we're using that not to employ extra people. I'm the Brexit liaison officer, so we're not spending it on unnecessary salaries. But what we are doing is looking at how we can support the system uh, within our borough to be more resilient, whether it's around food, fuel, whatever, which will also stand us in good stead in other, for other incidents, not just for Brexit. So uh, thinking every borough has their allocation now from MHLCG on that. Streamlining of uh, national government communications uh, through the system. I think that's been a welcome development actually from MHLCG. So as Brexit liaison officer, I get updates from every single government department. Up until recently, I didn't get it from DHSC, but Wayne will be pleased to know <coughs> now that's been put right. And that was actually part of the conversation we had with Keith Willits at the uh, regional event for the NHS uh, recently, because it's important to have uh, joined that people like me are getting a full uh, scope of what government planning is about. So, regionally, these are the issues that we're planning for. They're very similar to the national planning assumptions. So, transport and infrastructure, it's not just getting goods into the country, but how you get it round. So, Wayne's comments about distribution and perhaps being able to take uh, goods out of normal delivery hours is actually quite important here. If, people, if goods are coming in at different ports of entry, not through the famously named short straits, that's Dover Calais by the way. Uh, I only learned about that quite recently in terms of the, the, that name being used. I knew the importance of the route of course. But um, if things are coming in at different ports, that then obviously changes how uh, haulage and freight gets around the country. So people are, uh, things will build in some delay in getting things distributed around the country. Health and social care are really important. Fuel, food and water, obviously. Business and economy. So uh, areas that are very dependent on small and medium enterprises need to be thinking about the business continuities for those as opposed to those areas that have perhaps bigger industries. Society and community cohesion, really important in terms of messaging, in terms of dealing with people's fears, stress, anxiety. You will be dealing with it as social care providers in terms of carers, in terms of dealing with your own clients and customers' uh, anxieties, perhaps about things like medicine supply. So communication and reassurance is really important. And then being ready as organisations. So things I'm doing, I've just sent out today to all the service managers in Wigan Council, uh, an email asking them to update all of their <coughs> business continuity plans and let me have them, plus things like ICT preparedness as well, an exchange of data is really important to have that kind of organisational readiness up to speed. That's the sort of, that's sort of diagrammatically Martin's comments around the command and control structure. So we've got, we've had two national teleconferences to date with the Secretary of State for MHLCG, Robert Jenrick. Uh, and that has been actually quite a welcome thing to be able to get questions into MHLCG and get replies back. So that's actually been quite a welcome development in terms of improving communications between us at a local borough level and uh, MHLCG and central government uh, through this particular uh, system. It's not happened before. That's how I'm working locally. So I have a cross council tactical group, which includes colleagues for obviously from social care, but also across the whole gamut of local authority services. We're looking at the whole of our business continuity plans in terms of supply chains. So a bit of a comment to you, think about your own local supply chains. 
talk to your Brexit liaison officers or your commissioning <coughs> colleagues if you think there are issues in terms of local supply chains because we can help and support you on that. <coughs> and then we've done an impact assessment which obviously we've been discussing with uh, directors and of course with our political leads as well. So for me in terms of health and social care, <coughs> not to sort of uh, in any way go over what Wayne had to say but perhaps just to point out some issues that I think have been uh, at the heart of the planning and I've picked out a risk area and also something we could be doing and that's a new development. The good news is you'll get your flu jabs and I'll say a little bit more about that later but all flu vaccine supplies are going to be in the country by the end of October so uh, I've had Keith Willett's personal assurance on that one. Challenge for us uh, is around the uh, EU workers, of course. Less of a challenge perhaps in the northwest of England than other places, but clearly that's also about going forward in terms of cessation of, of current freedom of movement. Um, there is some provision now in terms of people who arrive in the UK either to take up work or to study or to live here, so that might be quite helpful to know in terms of recruitment. The other thing that the Home Office were really clear, keen to stress is that neither employers nor landlords should be asking for proof of settled status from current EU citizens. Really important to stress that uh, because there have been some reports in the newspapers that that has been happening. And then the other challenge for us, which we've alluded to already, is the fact that Brexit is happening at the start of winter and Martin alluded to the fact that we're out of the UK growing season so we haven't got locally produced food as available or readily available or much more dependent on imported food. My own borough is very much a food producer. I've got the European headquarters of Heinz. Who eats baked beans in the room? Right, if you eat baked beans it's made in Wigan. <laughs> World's biggest baked bean factory. So it's very important. Now, obviously, they make tinned food which will last a long time, but clearly they have to have fresh supplies coming in to continue to make that fresh food. Patak's Cuisines is also located in Wigan, and Baclavore. So every fresh salad pack that you ever get, those pack salads, they're packed in Wigan. You know, they're stingy. All bananas in the UK are also ripened in Wigan. So... Yeah, Wigan's the centre of the universe, obviously. Um, but the point about that is that, obviously, out some of our big industries in, in the borough are actually major food producers, and their business continuity is important for the rest of the country. In Greater Manchester, we have particularly good communications going on between the NHS and uh, the rest of of uh, us in the local system, so other multi-agency uh, planners, because that's been a long-standing arrangement in Greater Manchester, but I would echo uh, Martin's concerns that, and, and hope, I know that Wayne will feed this back, that there does need to be much more joined up communication. The NHS cannot be resilient without social care being resilient, nor can any of the system be resilient if public health falls over? So, you know, it's one part of the system is very reliant and interdependent on other parts of the system. So you are really important. One of the things that came out of last week's national teleconference, which was attended by Carolyn Dynage and by Clara Swinson, was that the new National Supply Disruption Centre uh, is being set up so this is going to look at any potential disruption to supplies of drugs clinical consumables non-clinical consumables medical devices it is being tested next week and I was really pleased to hear Clara confirm that there would be national contact and protocols uh, for social care providers as well as the NHS and there was an assurance given to a question from a, another borough elsewhere in the country that there would be parity of access. And I think that's a really important thing for you to know, 
that that will be available. Obviously, as soon as we get details of how you can contact uh, the uh, that centre and what the protocols will be for accessing their advice and support, we will make sure that's distributed to you. The other thing that, uh, the other areas that the NHS have been preparing on are additional warehouse capacity, very much under pressure at this time of year because we've got uh, Black Friday, Christmas, Halloween obviously as well. Um, so warehouse capacity nationally is under quite a bit of pressure at this time of year. So there have been, there have been plans to uh, provide some additional warehouse capacity. And then this idea of the buffer stocks that are around already in the UK, which Big Pharma have been particularly good at uh, putting together. So for me, food, big issue, we have to eat. Uh, including our very nice lunch, thank you very much. Um, DEFRA is giving reassurance about the supply of food, but choice may well be restricted. Other commentators have other views, of course. The points I'll pick out to you are, if food prices go up, could be 5 to 10%, that could impact on your workforce in terms of household costs. So one of the things we're doing locally is to be working with our food banks to make sure they have resilient support going into them because the likelihood is donations will go down just as a demand, potential demand goes up. Disruption, uh, the disruption you're likely to see is fresh fruit and veg. So that's the bit of the supply chain that may have a challenge. So one of the messages from me to you is work with us, work with your commissioners, work with your normal food supply chains, just check their arrangements and particularly check on those of your clients who have dietary, special dietary requirements. That will be the big, I think, the big challenge to do. Communications. Matt alluded to it, Martin alluded to it, Steph alluded to it. There is, of course, the national messaging campaign. You'll be hearing it on the radio, on telly, in the newspapers. There is, of course, the .gov website, which is being constantly updated with FAQs. And, of course, we in local authorities, as long, along with the NHS, have a statutory duty to warn and inform the public. And we will work with you on messaging. Because I think what's really important is that comms messaging is consistent. It must be transparent, it must be honest, but it must be consistent. So one of the things I would say to you is please work with us on any kind of public messaging or messaging to staff, just so that we get the consistency of messaging right. Um, our comms leads in Greater Manchester, for example, are working together, but please work with your local comms lead or your Brexit liaison officer around that. I can't solve Brexit, wish I could. That's for the politicians. But there are some other practical things you can do. And one thing I would say to you is, uh, it is the time of year. Noro, you're right, quite right, Wayne is on the <coughs> rise. But we know that other bugs are around. Metanumonia virus, respiratory syncytial virus, and our good old friend flu. And we've had quite a lot of challenge with flu in Australia. It always goes to Australia first and then comes to us. So one thing we can practically work with you on is making sure your staff training is up to date on, flu on infection prevention control. This is something really practical we can work with you on. Make sure that you are getting those kind of regimes and business continuity in place so that you can deal with anything that might come out of the blue from Brexit. This is basic business continuity. What we, one of the things we've got uh, locally, and Jenny might want, Jenny and Ray who are here from Wigan may want to say a little bit about this, 
is we have infection prevention control champions and flu champions in every single care home in the borough. And that helps us to deal with outbreaks really, really quickly. But it also means we've got somebody championing this work right across staff and also with residents. Because for some it's, of course, life-threatening. It can also put pressure on the acute end of the system, as we know. But it can also close you down, so it can affect your, your productivity as well. So, very simple. It's not about fancy drugs, washing hands. Catch it, didn't kill it. It's a big message from me. Hand washing is way, way more important than antibiotics. Very similar. This is the bug that we are particularly worried about in the winter. Influenza A. That's the big, that's the big nasty. That's the, that's the one that worries me as a director of public health. This is the thing that may well hit us coming into winter. So, a bit of a perfect storm, isn't it? We're dealing with a, a situation which impacts on the whole of the country, Brexit. We may have a concurrent incident with a major flu outbreak. So, part of our planning for Brexit is about dealing with concurrent incidents, not just the ongoing situation. Vaccines. We hear a lot of myths about vaccines. I am megaly pro-vaccine partly because I had measles at the age of five, which uh, measles pneumonia left me with dodgy eyesight, asthma, and I'm rather short. <laughs> but it was also the reason I became a doctor, because I had a very early lesson in prevention is better than cure. The MMR vaccine wasn't available when I was five, because it was in the 1960s. So, flu vaccine this year, likely to be efficacious. It reduces the incidence of severe disease, not just in your residents, but in your staff as well. So we know the vaccine uh, supply will be fine this year. It's here, it, we've actually started the programme already in Wigan. And we actually do, uh, in our borough, fund an extra programme for social care staff because we think it's so important that care home staff and domiciliary care staff get vaccinated to protect themselves, their families, and of course, the vulnerable citizens they so are so committed to caring for. So I will end my little slot, if you didn't think it was important, with Carol's story. Carol, as you will hear, was a nurse, or is a nurse. machine that forced oxygen in me that I couldn't tolerate. It was on my face, I couldn't tolerate it. I remember being leant over like an old man, gasping for your breath, and it was me in the end that had to say, I can't do this no more. There's been days when I've just broke down crying because I'm not the same person as I were, you know, and it's going to be some time before I get back to being that person. My name's Carol, I'm 43 years old, I'm married, I've got two children and two stepchildren, I'm a health visitor, my job is very important to me. It's obviously it's um, I've trained as a nurse. I've I've gone out to train as a health visitor. I like the job I do. You know I'm going out helping people. I'm usually very fit and healthy. I did start with a little bit of mild asthma, um, usually after exercise, but I didn't really think it was much of a problem. Didn't used to use inhalers very often, only occasionally. So because I, I was quite fit and healthy, I didn't really think that I needed the flu vaccination. I associated it with people who was elderly or had severe um, chest conditions. I didn't class mine as being severe. Um, 
I did go to the GP for something, it, it, you know, not associated with my chest. And he did ask me, did I want the flu jab? As I do have a bit of a phobia about needles, um, I decided to decline his, his offer. Um, and so the box was ticked. The GP had asked his question um, and I left not thinking anything more of it, really. It was the week before Christmas and um, I was feeling a bit chesty, but that's, you know, as having some mild asthma, you do get chest infections in the winter. I'd felt ill all week in a, in a way I couldn't describe, in a way I'd never felt ill before. I couldn't put my finger on it, what it was. So I thought something was wrong, but obviously I didn't know what was ahead of me. So I got through Christmas Day, then the following day, which was Boxing Day, I was waking up, my husband was bringing me some um, hot ribene and then I was falling back to sleep again. And it got to lunchtime and I just knew I wasn't well. So I did go to accident emergency and, and then I was just taken into the resource department. Again, I wasn't really sure what was going on. I didn't know what it was. Um, and then they'd explained to me that they thought it was swine flu and um, I needed to be admitted. So I was admitted into high dependency. It just shows you how quickly things, you know, once they're there, they, they take a hold of you. So when I was on high dependency, it was, um, as a patient, you're very vulnerable and very scary when they come with machinery that maybe you're used to using on other patient, but when it's been used on you, it's very scary. I had a machine that forced oxygen in me that I couldn't tolerate. It was on my face, I couldn't tolerate it. It was really tight and it wasn't particularly working. So then they had to put like an astronaut's mask on me and I am quite um, claustrophobic. It was literally like a, a spaceman's helmet that fastened very tightly around your neck. And then if you wanted a drink, there was a zip that unzipped. And uh, they said to me, Keep that on, keep you keep that on for about a day, you know, it'll improve things. So obviously you'll do anything because you want to get better. Um, three days later, <gasps> um, it was still on and it and it wasn't doing the trick. I remember being lent over like an old man, gasping for your breath, and it was me in the end that had to say, I can't do this no more. Um, so then they took me to be ventilated. And they didn't realise how poorly I was until I was ventilated. Because then to be told that night, after I just said, I'll see you in a couple of days to my children and my husband, um, to then a few hours later be told that I might not survive the night is unbelievable. When they first informed me that they thought it was um, swine flu, um, although I was in high dependency, I still didn't really think um, what danger I was potentially in. I was aware that there was a lot of young people at that point that when they got swine flu, some died from it. And at the back of my head, I was aware of that, but I think I was being quite optimistic. Um, but as long, along with the swine flu, I also had the pneumonia then, double pneumonia. My family's experience, obviously, theirs has been worse than mine because a lot I can't remember really from New Year's Day to Valentine's Day. So there's a, you know, I've missed out a whole month, a month and a half. Um, my family, obviously, they were being told on a regular basis, I'm not going to survive. If I survive the night, you know, it's very dramatic um, talk and very, um, upsetting for, for everybody concerned. There's been days when I was in hospital that I really wished I hadn't survived because it was so difficult breathing, just something simple breathing, it was so difficult. But with support from my husband and my family, you know, those days were made a little bit easier. But every day has been a fight, you know. Um, there has been days that are harder than others. 
Um, there's been days when I've just brought down crying because I'm not the same person as I were, you know, and it's going to be some time before I get back to being that person. It's left me with um, less of a lung capacity at the moment. I've had a um, lung function test and they're just 50%, so that's like managing on one lung. But um, you, the, you've got to be very optimistic with things and, and you know, uh, try and reach the goals that you, that you want. The, the reason I've agreed to do this story is because I want, I want other people to learn from my mistake, if you like. You know, I never thought that I would get something so life-threatening. Um, I didn't think much about the flu jab. I thought it was for the elderly. I thought it was for the very poorly. So I think it's really important that my, um, my colleagues and other healthcare professionals um, seek out the flu vaccination to protect themselves, to protecting the colleagues uh, and protecting their own family, no matter how fit or athletic they think they are. Just a little <coughs> snippet of what can happen to a healthy person. If you think about it, that's your staff, isn't it? So, um, <coughs> my diagnostic test for flu is, if I stuck a 20 quid note at the bottom of your bed and you couldn't be bothered to reach for it, that's flu. It's not a cold, it's not a mild illness. It's a really nasty, serious disease. So, one of the things that's really important for us going in for the next few months is to make sure we've got business continuity in place to deal with the staff, the food, the fuel, the supplies to keep you going as businesses and obviously dealing with some of the medium term aspects in terms of increasing costs but also to make sure we're fully prepped and prepared to deal with any concurrent incidents like a big flu outbreak or like a big neuro outbreak. Thank you for listening.